declaring the end from the beginning. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Bear fruit to God that your fruit should remain. A heartful shalom, everyone. May thoughts of love and soul harmony find you in your home. Thanks for paying attention as we continue our comparative study of the Garden of Eden story to illustrate practical understanding of our three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. In this presentation, we shift our focus to the first man created, Adam, a type of spirit. If you haven't already, watch the previous video where we took a look at the person of Eve to understand our soul. Now, to start our endeavor in understanding the spirit man, we need to take a closer look at Genesis 2-7 and peel layers of perspective. And we start by looking at the composition of our triune nature. Genesis 2-7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. There's a hint for flesh and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that spirit, and man became a living being, or soul. It is interesting to note that the human body is made up of a long list of ingredients, with the most abundant being oxygen, hydrogen, carbon. Now our flesh or our body, just like all known life to earth, is primarily made up of carbon. When you think of oxygen, we relate it to the breath of life blown from the breath of the Creator, Lord God. Combination of the textual components described in Genesis 2-7 made Adam a living being or soul. Think of us. Mankind is made up of up to 70% of water bodily and up to 90% on a cellular level. To make all of this water within us contained, we need a sturdy clay vessel. At your own time, check out how clay pots are made and the process of preparing them for the potter. And you'll see how precise Isaiah 64, 8 is in describing us as clay to the potter and how we are the work of his hand. But put simply, to make clay, you're going to need dry soil and water. So, so far, we're not seeing water in Genesis 2, 7. If you bear with me, I will show you where I see water is introduced. The Creator literally selected, took dust from the ground to form Adam. In Hebrew, the word dust is dry land. So you're wondering where did the Creator pick up dust that is specifically dry? If you look to Genesis 1 verse 9 to 10, you're going to see the same Hebrew word yabasha used in Genesis 2 in the creation of Adam, used twice in Genesis 1 verse 9 to 10, where dry land appeared in the separation between the waters under the heaven. An interesting word study is this word dry or yabasha, as it seems to appear in scriptures when the Most High is setting apart his people for salvation. Just as a quick diversion, going back to my point, our carbon vessels were once taken from dry earth. Then the Lord God breathed. The Hebrew word there is nafash, or to blow. It is an action word. And the Lord God breathed into the nostrils of Adam. The Hebrew word behind nostril is also face. So think of a face-to-face -face encounter here with the Lord God. It is important to take note that the action word nafash in Genesis 1 and 2 is unique to the creation of Adam in Genesis 2. Nowhere else in the creation account will you see the Creator Himself in such close proximity as with Adam. In addition to this unique breathing action performed by the Creator to Adam, we also need to pay extra attention to what was given to Adam. The text says, 
that the Lord God breathed into his nostrils or into his face the breath of life. In Hebrew, that's neshama chai. The Hebrew word neshama means breath and is sometimes used in place of nefesh, which means soul, or ruach, which means spirit. Now you can see how we can easily gloss over this word and put all of our understanding of this word in one bucket. But there's more to what meets the eye in the word neshama. In the word construct of neshama, you see the Hebrew word shem, which means a name. Now think of the substance that was breathed into Adam, the neshama tied to the name of the creator. Name is always tied to the character of the being behind the name. The most high's attributes, his image, his love, his power, his sound mindedness was breathed into Adam. Neshama also hints the Hebrew word shamayim. Look at the last part of that word. You're going to see mayim or Hebrew letter mem, which means water in Hebrew. Are you making the connection yet? The creator took dry earth and then he blew his neshama of life. And this mayim is a part of this neshama. This water was added to this dry earth. So just like how clay is being prepared by the potter to be fashioned into a vessel, Adam is being made to be a vessel or a carrier or a bearer of something. Now, what is Adam designed to be a carrier of or to be a bearer of? Let's step back and appreciate the specialty of the way Adam was made. Adam was formed with such peculiar face-to-face -face attention and with such intimacy. This is what makes Adam a unique living soul. He is the first Malki Zadi, which is a title for king of righteousness. This phrase, living being or soul, in Hebrew it's Chai Nefesh. The scripture says that the first man, Adam, became a living being or a living soul. Think of living water. Even sages and Hebrew teachers have used water as a metaphor for Torah, as necessary as water is to sustain life, growth, and our gift of existence. Now, Adam's Chai Nefesh, his living soul, is set apart from all of creation. If you look back to Genesis 1, the living creatures referred to in Genesis 1, even in Genesis 2, you're going to see them as referred to as Chai Nefesh also. So you're wondering, what is the difference? Well, for one, you're going to notice that there is no specific description of the same action word that the Creator has done to Adam, to any other living creature. This action of breathing, this Hebrew word nafash. The second difference is key because it has to do with the substance of the breath that was breathed, that was given unto Adam. The Most High, Creator God's neshama of life himself, is what was infused into Adam's being, the Creator's name, his character, his living water. Because neshama is sometimes used as breath or nefesh, which means soul or ruach or spirit, as a serious student of the Bible, we might want to pay attention to the distinction between ruach and neshama. As these are translated, either breath or spirit, and noting the difference can be of significance to one's perspective. The distinction is made clear in several scriptures, but we highlight two in this presentation. Job 32, 8, but there is a spirit or ruach in man, and the breath, neshama, of the Almighty gives him understanding. Again, in Job 33, 4, The spirit or ruach of God has made me, and the breath, neshama, of the Almighty gives me life. All of creation is ultimately animated or moved by the spirit of the creator. He is the creator of all creators. He is the creator of all things. Now, all living creatures or flesh are described with Chai nefesh, or souls, which means cattle, wild beasts, birds, sea creatures also have souls. But their souls are like specific programming 
built into them by the Creator to live out their specific purpose here on earth. We see this in a creature called Leviathan, described in Job 41.21. His breath, nefesh, that's the word for soul, kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. To understand the difference between the spirit and soul and neshama, I'd like to add something into the mix. If you've heard of this robot called Sophia, she is a social humanoid, AI-based robot. And the way she is powered is by electricity and she can actually express herself. But her expression is really based on a programmable intelligence type software built into her. The spirit or energy source is what powers or animates Sophia. She can move and she can walk and talk. The program or the software installed in her is what makes her appear like she has a soul. When she gets into a conversation, she's talking to individuals with her AI-based mind, thought, emotion, intellect programmed within her. But Sophia does not have the neshama blown into her vessel. In fact, the kai nefesh that she has is man-made, not even the same as the living creatures described in creation. What I'm trying to express is that the ruach on its own is the spirit that animates living creatures and their soul is their specific programmed purpose. But they don't have the same level of higher consciousness, free will, intelligence as mankind or as Adam was given by the Creator in Genesis 2. Another important note, Ruach on its own does not necessarily refer to the Ruach or Spirit of the Most High God. Throughout Scripture, you're going to see references to Spirit of Man, Spirit of Fear, Spirit of Jealousy. Even deceiving spirit mentioned in 1 Kings 22.22. So far, we've made the important distinction between Genesis 1 creation and Adam's specific special creation in Genesis 2. Him being unique in that the blowing, the action word breathed of the creator's neshama of life infused into Adam. Yahuwah, the Most High's name, his character, and living water in what was dry earth, made all of Adam became a living soul. With this in mind, let's rephrase Genesis 2-7 accordingly. The Lord God took from the dry earth and blew into clay's face Adam, the creator's name, his character, and his living water. And the combination of these key elements made Adam a set-apart living soul, a set-apart kai nefesh. Now, I'd like to illustrate how the first family came to being in the Garden of Eden. Ab, as father creator, planted his garden home for Adam and Eve, his little children, to dwell in. Also, throughout the illustration, keep in mind that I have postulated that Adam is a type of spirit or the breath of the creator and Eve is a type of soul. So before we start, I need to introduce you to the idea of chiasm. The Bible is full of chiasm. Both writers and speakers employ this type of technique to help emphasize and reiterate key ideas. Abba is an example of what is known as a chiastic structure. Chiasm is a language technique that presents a sequence of ideas and then repeats it in reverse order with the purpose of introducing something new or putting emphasis to an idea. Kind of like the menorah example we referred to in the previous video, we see three branches on one side and another set of three branches on the opposite side. Both sides are pointing towards the middle structure. In a sense, the glory or emphasis is in the middle or the vine of the menorah. Many passages in the Bible exhibit a chiastic structure. For example, Jesus' words in Mark 2.27 are in the form of chiasm. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The emphasis made is found in the middle of the phrase, and that is man. The words Sabbath and man are repeated in reverse order. The result is a mirror effect as the ideas are bounced off of both sides, in a sense reflected back to bring about emphasis to the middle. Imagine it as a ring structure. The middle or the center of the circle is the point of attention. If you love to study the word, you'll note that there is an interconnection between the old and the new covenant, in that the new covenant is concealed in the old and the old covenant is revealed in the new. It really is one book. The old and new makes each other complete. 
kind of like a ring structure. Using the same principle, the word Abba found only three times in the New Covenant. The Hebrew word for father is the first two sequence. And the Hebrew word for father is Ab. And this word appears in the Old Covenant many times. There's also an interconnectedness that I see here. In a sense, we can also say that the letters Ab in the Old is revealed as Abba in the New. Word Abba in the New is concealed in the Old as Ab. Now keep that mental note in your mind as we go through this word exercise. In the word Abba, I'd like to draw your attention to the two sequences to start with. A, B, the first two letters. In Hebrew, that means father. The last two letters, the second sequence, which is found in the last two letters, is B, A. So remember the chiastic structure. A, B is father in Hebrew. Let's coin the term being Adam. B, A. And we coined that term because we look to the text in Genesis 2-7 where Adam is from the breath of the father's neshama of life and man became a living being. So that's why we call it being Adam. The chiastic structure of the word Abba where A-B is repeated in reverse order which is B-A. The point is for Adam to reflect a mirror image of the father. So being Adam or B-A is the express image or reflection of the Father, a type of Messiah who was to come. Paul gave us a hint of this in Romans 5.14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So if Adam is a type of Messiah, word became flesh. From the word Abba, you see that B.A. or being Adam separated from his father Ab, left his position in his heavenly father to dwell in the Garden of Eden. John 1 14 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So Adam is a type of word became flesh. And we know that Adam came to being when the neshama or the breath of life of the creator was breathed unto him. So breath comes from our lungs, right? John 1.18 says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom, or the chest of the Father, he hath declared him, or spoke him. Now we will see being Adam, or B-A, divide further. Remember our text Genesis 2-7? Note the latter part. And the man became a living being, or soul. I mentioned several times already that Eve is a type of soul. So when we read Genesis 2.21, we see that the woman was taken from man, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs, or side, another word for that is side, and closed up the flesh in its place. So the being in Adam was taken from him. So verse 22 says, And the rib, or from the side of Adam, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. So Adam's being separated from his rib and became the woman, who we now know as Eve. So she is a type of being, a type of soul. Note that the idea behind the separation is so that they can become one flesh again. We see this idea of leaving and then joining in Genesis 2.24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Separation by itself is incomplete. The Father's perfect will for separation is only a means, a temporary means, only to start the process of completion. The Father's perfect will for separation is temporary because it's only a means to start the process of completion. Separation is the beginning of the end for a new beginning. After Adam's being was brought forth by the Father, Eve came to being from Adam, literally from his side. She separated from Adam. We will see in the unfolding of the story of Adam and Eve that they will experience further separation. But we will see that the separation is so that a provision can be made for reconciliation to them first and then for the whole world. 
And it is in their maturity or their completion that they are made fit vessels for honor for the master's use in the way they live out their purpose as image bearers of the Most High. And with that, we will see, we will start to understand the purpose of our spirit and our soul within us. In the next presentation, we will examine the purpose behind the place of the garden and the position that Adam and Eve was in before the fall. Until then, be still and know. See you next time. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you.